Well, good morning, everybody. I do want to welcome you to uh, Central this morning. Glad that you're with us. Uh, please take a moment to uh, fill out a Connect card. And uh, if you have any announcements, prayer requests, uh, you, you need to tell your preacher something, you have a suggestion, uh, you don't like the tie of uh, the elder, uh, Ken Dodge, uh, whatever you need to put on that card, uh, uh, just indic- you have the freedom to, to share whatever you'd like to share on those cards. And then uh, you can put those cards and any offerings, tithes, offerings you might have in the box under the exit sign in the back. So thank you uh, for doing that, and thank you for being here today. And uh, we're just looking forward to meeting as the family of God here that meets at Gearing Central and then just lifting up the name of Jesus uh, this morning. And we have a special uh, treat this morning. Uh, we've got a bunch of kids coming forward a little later, and they're going to sing a song. And so um, it's going to be a good day to, to be together. I do want to just uh, remind you that uh, we're going to try to do our kickoff. Uh, COVID forced us to move away from our Wednesday night family uh, meetings, and and we're going to try to reopen that uh, Wednesday night, uh, February third, with a with a simple meal, and then uh, at seven o'clock. That's at six o'clock on the third, and then at seven o'clock that evening we'll have uh, classes uh, for all ages. So. Again, we're looking forward to getting our midweeks uh, back in order here at Central. So February 3rd, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, uh, meal at 6 and classes at 7. Also, I want to uh, make mention that our love offering for Summit Christian College will be on Sunday, February 14th as part of, as part of their love month, uh, February 14th. Be prepared to give a love offering to Summit Christian College. And uh, I also just want to make mention that it's, it's kind of a rare occasion when we have two of our missions uh, that we support here in attendance. We have Linda Smith here from Hong Kong, and we have Amber Berlin from wherever it is she lives. Um, it's in Europe somewhere. <laughs> Right? Bosnia. Bosnia somewhere. And we're, we're grateful that you're both uh, here uh, to, to worship with us and, uh, and uh, just be with us. And, and so, so thank you for being here. That I'm going to pray, and then this uh, beautiful team here, even you, will lead us in our worship this morning. God, we thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for this day. God, may all that we do and say here bring honor and glory to your name, draw us closer to you, closer to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we get started, we want to dismiss the kids who are going to be singing in just a little bit. You guys can go ahead and go to the back. You're going to curse a little bit. You're part of the the group singing. Go ahead and head on back. And as they're going, let's stand together as we worship our great God and King. you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will
will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Oh, let's come. Come. Now is the time to worship. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. All group that I'm a part of this past week started a new study about grace being greater. And God's grace is truly amazing. Amen. It gives us what we don't deserve and it sets us free from the bondage that we find in our sin. Oh, your grace, Father, is enough for us today. Let's sing that together. Great is your faithfulness, O God of Jacob. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead me by still waters into mercy. When nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. Justice, God of Jacob, you use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation, and all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. you turn and say good morning to those around you, and then you may be seated.
Well, go ahead and be seated. Done a lot of reflecting in the last week and a half or so, and a lot of things going on in our in our family, and by family I mean our church family, in the the world around us in general, and uh, it, it's easy to start doubting things during this time, isn't it? When things don't make sense to us, why they've had to turn out one way or the other, and uh, and I've just been almost dwelling too much on it, I guess. As I look at the Scripture, I found this portion in John chapter 16. Jesus has been talking to His disciples about what is to come. He knows what lays before Him in in His arrest and His trial and and His hanging upon the cross and His his death. He's trying to communicate with the disciples about these things. It's going to be uncertain times. And he wants them to be ready. And I found these words at the very end of this chapter in John 16. And Jesus, after he's said all these things to them, he says to them, Do you now believe? Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And this is the part that that really got to me. After he says, in me you will have peace, he follows that up by saying, you will have suffering. You will have suffering in this world. We've experienced that, haven't we? Or we are in the midst of experiencing that. We hurt as a, as a body with the loss of, of a bright young man. We hurt because our country is such a mess. And so we understand suffering, don't we? He says, you will have suffering. But then he says this, be courageous. I have conquered the world. Oh, may we find our peace in Jesus today and know that as we trust in him, we too, as Lyle is going to share with us in a moment this morning, we too conquer the world. When peace like a
today amen as we come to our time of prayer this morning uh, obviously we want to continue to lift the Santos family up in our prayers uh, it was a wonderful service yesterday celebrating Justin's life and if you haven't had a chance to to see that or participate in it uh, I'd encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and watch that uh, very very good service um, so be praying for, for the Santos family as they continue to, to mourn and grieve uh, the loss of, of Justin. Also continue to pray for Sonia Whaley as she recovers. I uh, understand she's doing well, but it's a long road, so continue to pray for her. Any other requests this morning? Yeah, Ken. Okay. Wednesday's International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, how easily it is to forget those atrocities. And so we, we remember and we pray that nothing like that ever happens again. Anything else? If you'll take the next few moments, lift your hearts to the Lord, share your prayers, your praises with Him, and then I will close us. Father, I'm reminded that the words that we just sang were written by a man who had lost seemingly everything, his wife, his children. And yet he could say in all faith and trust that it is well with my soul. And as we come together and at this time, remembering the loss of, of a loved one, a grieving May we too proclaim in faith that it is well. That because of you, we can have peace and be courageous because you have conquered the world. May all of our trust be in that today, Lord. May we submit ourselves fully to you, following where you lead us, obeying as you've commanded us. Lead our steps, lead our hearts, lead our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, at this time, we'll have the kids come. Our, Teresa, are they back there someplace? All right, have them come on out. And we'll enjoy some Christmas music that we didn't get to enjoy last month because of the craziness of the time. So, welcome our children.
Didn't they do a great job? Yeah. So now all of the kids are dismissed to go back to Children's Church and we worship. So you can all head on back. One with my water. Well, who says you can't have Christmas in January, huh? Especially like the little bells. I'd, I'd like to maybe get me a set of those and kind of get you guys in rhythm sometimes when I'm thinking you're uh, lacking. You got keys, that's right. That's kind of like bells, keys. My wife led that year. That means that you just added 10 more minutes to the sermon. So thank Mrs. Heinbaugh for that. <laughs> We're uh, uh, going through uh, the book of Romans, and uh, we've, um, you know, we've kind of taken some detours and had to go off on little things here and there, but uh, we, uh, I, I just have never preached through the whole book of Romans before, and, and so um, we're, we've come to Romans uh, chapter 8, the, the final verses, 31 through 39, and um, I took the title right from the, the text, Overwhelmingly Conquer, and uh, that's a uh, that's a pretty cool picture uh, of, uh, you know, just uh, kind of reminds us how, how powerful we are, the victory we have uh, in Jesus. How many of you remember, how many of you remember the Tom and Jerry cartoons? Tom and Jerry, was that one of your favorite cartoons? Yeah, one of my favorites. Tom and Jerry, Tom the cat was always trying to catch and eat Jerry the mouse. And uh, the series was, you know, it was kind of silly it, some ways predictable and filled with that slapstick violence, but one in the in in one of the cartoon stories, Jerry Jerry rescued Spike, the bulldog, from the dog catcher, and out of his gratitude, Spike told Jerry that any time he needed help, all he'd have to do is whistle. And Jerry quickly learned how to call on Spike any time Tom the cat was after him. And it was amazing how bold and confident Jerry the Mouse became when he had Spike to back him up. Kind of like when Charles Gwynn and I walked through the tough parts of uh, you know, town. I'll walk with Charles. Charles is really bold because he knows Lyle's got his back. Right, Charles? That's right. I read a story about a 13-year-old black boy who had just moved into a predominantly white neighborhood. This young man ran into a nest of white supremacy at school, and he began to suffer from torment and persecution. And oftentimes, he'd come home crying and beaten up, and his mother, not knowing what to do, she just began to pray about that situation. And after a week or so, the biggest kid in school appeared at their doorstep, and he, he told them that he was a Christian that he, he knew they were Christians and that he had come to tell them that he had went to every kid in school that had mistreated them and told them if they ever did anything like that again, they would have to answer to him. Now, can you imagine the, the, that little boy going back to school, walking in the shadow of his new friend and thinking, if this big guy is for me, who could be against me? If Spike the dog is for me, me as a little mouse have nothing to worry about. And see, the great truth that I want to connect is today is that when you have the right person, when you have the right person for you, it doesn't matter who is against you. And really, that's Paul's point at the end of Romans chapter 8. When he says, if God is for us, who is against us? 
You see, the final verses of Romans 8 are, are many people's favorite verses from Romans and, and even from the Bible, and we often hear these verses read at, at funerals, and, and such a passage is certainly appropriate for a funeral, but we must not miss the purpose Paul had for these verses in, in this letter to the Romans. Paul used every rhetorical device in his arsenal to move his readers to a new level of confidence in God's provision for his people. Verses 31 through 39 are not only the crescendo of chapter 8, but are the climax and conclusion of this section of the letter reaching all the way back to Romans chapter 5. Since chapter 5, Paul has been encouraging us to trust in our salvation and to trust in the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. In chapter 8, Paul has been emphasizing the truths that lead to our victorious living, and they include the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. You remember in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when the, the, pe the people cried out, Brothers, what shall we do? Is there anything that we can do? And Peter replied, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, chapter 8 of Romans, the first 13 verses, uh, remind us of that Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And then the, uh, the rest of chapter 8, we see the verses 14 through 17, our, our honor position as adopted sons and daughters in God's family. And then verses 18 through 30 talks about our, our glorious inheritance that we have to look forward to. And then this final section speaks to the fact that God loves us and that He is on our side. And as Paul has often done in Romans, he, he launches his new direction with a question. He says in verse 31, what then are we to say about these things? Oh, well, what things? Well, the things that came in the previous verses of the chapter, the things that for you and I, the things that I have been railing, I guess, against or for in Romans chapter 8, that it have showed us all that God has done for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul then proceeds to answer that question in the form of five more questions. These five questions summarize the, the love of God and the grace of God. All that God has done for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're actually rhetorical questions, meaning they don't require an answer. And these questions, with their implied answers, reveal some great truths about God. The first one describes God as our protector. God as our protector. The question is, who can be against us? What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? This is the question that the people of the world want answered. Is there a God? And if there is a God, is he for us or is he against us? When Paul says, if God be for us, he's not saying maybe he is and maybe he isn't. Maybe it would be better translated, since God is for us, or because God is for us. There is no truth more fundamental in all of God's Word than this truth. God is for us. God is for us. He's not against us. God is not neutral toward us. Because of Jesus Christ, once and for all, the question is settled. God is is for us. All that God is, all that God has, all that God does, He does that for you. He does that for me. He does that for His people. Even those times when God seems to be acting against us, if we could only look behind the veil even in those times, we would understand that God 
is for us. You see, God is not a... I think some people have this vision of God that he's this crabby old man in the sky. And he just, he's just watching anxiously for us to mess up so that he can condemn us to hell. Here's the thing about God is God's not that guy. He wants to see us make it. You matter to him. So much that he made the supreme sacrifice on our behalf. And so if you really want to go to heaven, he has provided the way and he really wants to see that happen. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is not against us. He is for us. He's on our side. He's on our team. He's our friend. And when you have a friend like God, you don't need to be afraid of anyone. So who can separate us or who can be against us? Well, actually, there are a lot of people who try to oppose us. Satan is against us, trying to defeat us, trying to, de trying to destroy us, trying to question whether God's love is real. Our old sin nature, our flesh is lined up against us, trying to bring us back into the... Nothing would please Satan more than to see the old vile or the old too. And I can't imagine that. God is so good, though. God is good all the time. Satan is against us. Our old sin nature is against us. Unbelievers may be against us. Jealous of our peace and joy. How can you have peace and joy in a pandemic? You know, I think sometimes they might be resentful that we have peace and joy, resentful of our rejection of sin. So Paul isn't saying that we Christians don't have any opponents. Rather, the point Paul makes is that it makes no difference who is against us. They cannot prevail so long as we are aware of the greatness of our God and that we are resting in His sovereign care. Just list the enemies of the people of God. Can the devil stand against us? No, he's been defeated. We've read the rest of the story. He's been defeated. Can the world stand against us? No, because Jesus has overcome the world. Can the flesh destroy us? No, because in Jesus Christ we overcome the pull of the flesh. Therefore, let the people of God be secure. Let the people of God be bold. That's the truth of Romans 8.31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Secondly, God is our provider. And the second question is, will he not give us all things? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? This is the question of provision. Will God hold back anything that his people need? And Paul answers this by giving us an argument from the greater to the lesser. If God didn't spare even his own precious son, but delivered him up to die on the cross for us, can we possibly doubt his love and concern for us? The fact that he for us is for us and that he has been by our side. See, he's already given us his best. He's already given us his greatest, his dearest, his most precious possession. Do you remember when he gave it to us? He gave it while we were yet sinners. While we were helpless, 
And while we were helpless, that's when he gave it. Can we possibly think that he would now withhold something necessary for our passage into heaven and eternal life? When he gave his greatest when we were helpless? If a mother will give up her baby for adoption, do you think she will object if they ask to take his clothes? Paul's argument is hard to miss. The same argument is in Romans chapter 5, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Did you notice that the text says all things? All things. What what a marvelous promise. Paul is obviously not talking about material things. This is not a rallying cry for the health and wealth gospel hucksters. Remember, it was Jesus who said that a person's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Certainly, God is going to supply our physical and material needs. He promised that in Matthew 6, 33 and Philippians 4, 19. God promised to take care of us. God promised to meet every one of our needs. But God never promised to cater to our greeds. He'll meet our needs He will not cater to our greeds. Paul himself had very little of this world's goods. Certainly, Paul is talking about everything we need to complete our salvation and make us ultimately like Christ, glorified, as he puts it in verse 30. J.I. Packer sums up this great promise. He says, one day we shall see that nothing Literally nothing which could have increased our eternal happiness has been denied us, and that nothing, literally nothing, that could have reduced that happiness has been left with us. Three, God is our defender. Who will bring charges against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, but rather was raised, who is the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. The next two questions both have the same general idea. They they take us into the courtroom where we stand before the divine judge. And the prosecuting attorney is none other than Satan. The accuser, according to Revelation 12.10, the accuser of the brethren. But we have a defender. We have a legal defender, a a counsel for the defense, Jesus. So let's tune in to the next question and see how he defends us. Who will bring charges against God's elect? To bring a charge against is a legal term that refers to making a formal accusation, pressing charges. That's exactly what Satan tries to do. Just as he did with Job, Satan goes before the judge and says, you can't let Mike Maris into heaven, Lord. You know what a sinner he is? What rotten thoughts he has in his mind? Likes the Dallas Cowboys. What unkind words come out of his mouth. Kicks on the Pittsburgh Steeler guy. What awful things he has done. Uh, Truth be known, Satan's accusations are valid at times. Satan knows what we're like, but the point of the verse is that it doesn't matter. 
Because God is the one who justifies. In other words, the judge himself has declared you and me to be righteous if we're in Christ. And God did that with his eyes wide open. With full knowledge of all our sins and all of our shortcomings. If God has exonerated me knowing full well how rotten I am, then nobody can challenge his verdict. Satan has no court of appeal. He gets nowhere with his charges. Case is closed. Next question is similar. Who is the one who condemns? Well, certainly there are many who try to condemn us. Our own consciences try to condemn us at times. Unbelievers will point their finger at our inconsistencies at times. And Satan is always there leveling his charges. As we all admit, we all have our shortcomings. We all fall short of God's perfection, don't we? But none of this con condemnation sticks to us if we are in Christ. Well, who is it that can condemn us and make it stick? The answer is no one. Paul gives us a, a short course here, just one verse. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, but rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. This is foundation. Body of Christ, this is foundation. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus ascended. And Jesus intercedes for us in heaven. You see, when Jesus died, he paid the price for our sin completely and forever. When Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated Satan once and for all. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he was seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And now what is Jesus doing? He's interceding for us. When we sin and we are condemned by others, and even when we fail to meet up to our own standards, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. May my blood cover them. The blood of Jesus is more than enough. Who can condemn us before the throne of God? Nobody. Jesus, who lives in heaven, makes intercession for us. You remember how chapter 8 started? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That sums up these first four verses and first four questions. And if there were two words that can sum up the last question that occupies the last five verses, it would be no separation. And this question reveals our last question God is our keeper. God is our keeper. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or trouble or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as is written, for your sake we are, we are killed all day long. We were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer. There's the title to the message. We overwhelmingly conquer. Through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So who can separate us from the love of God? No one. This teaches us that Christ is not fickle. Those he loves, he loves forever. Paul mentions a number of things that somebody might think can separate us from the love of God. He, he starts with tribulation. The, the word means pressure. Do you ever feel like you're in a vice? Do you ever feel like you're in the vice and somebody's Throwing it down. 
And when you feel like you're in a vice and it it feels like somebody's screwing it down, it, it can make you wonder whether God still loves you or not. Well, doubt it no longer. Affliction and trouble and pressure cannot separate you from Christ's love. Trouble or distress is the next word. The first word refers to sort of those outward pressures. This one probably refers to Anybody experienced inner turmoil? Inner turmoil, that's what this word is, trouble or distress. It's that inner turmoil. It's when your guts are churning. Don't know what to do. Don't know how to handle it. It's almost worse than if somebody's kind of got you in a vice on the outside, that, that inner turmoil. Persecution is the next thing mentioned, and it was a constant threat to the early church. Famine is a scarce, scarcity of food. Some people literally don't know where their next meal is coming from. Nakedness simply refers to a lack of adequate clothing. Danger is a general term that we're probably familiar with. Sword stands for a violent death. When Christians face these things, they may ask the questions. Maybe you're asking them this morning. How could... God, allow this to happen to me, to us. He really loved me. How could he allow that to happen? Why doesn't God love me anymore? And Paul wants us to understand that Christians are going to face all kinds of troubles. But those troubles don't separate us from God's love and are not an indication that God doesn't love us. See, I don't know where we get the idea in the first place that Christians aren't supposed to have any problems. Paul quotes from Psalm 44, verse 22, to explode that misconception. As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Trials are nothing new, are they? They're nothing new or unexpected for the child of God. They have been part of the lives of God's people since time began. Some have even lived with the daily threat of death. Amber, do you know anything about that? Some people live with a daily threat of death, which is what that verse is talking about. But far from being able to separate us from the love of Christ, trials are our means to greater triumph. The next verse says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Notice those five words, we are more than conquerors. That's five words in the English, but in the Greek it's only one word. The word literally means Super conquerors or super overcomers. That's why I like that picture there because that picture looked like a super conqueror, super overcomer. But Karen thinks of me. Ha! Super overcomer. Therefore, we will not fear when we go to the rough part of town. <laughs> Wherever that's at. I don't know if we have a rough part of town. Maybe we do. Notice what it says, that we are super overcomers in all these things. In the midst of these things. Not by deliverance from these things, but in them. While we experience them. These trials we face not only do not destroy us, when we know that God is for us, they help us. They become our friends that help us grow stronger and more courageous in our faith. Again, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, Paul ends here with a personal testimony. He writes, for I am convinced. Pretty hard to argue with the testimony. That's why 
encourage people to have a testimony. Share your testimony. Share your testimony, the things that you're convinced about. Paul speaks from experience. He's convinced or persuaded that none of these things can separate him. He covers the whole gamut. He doesn't leave anything out. Some people are afraid of death. Others are afraid of life. With all its uncertainties and all its sorrows and its hardships and its disappointments, but neither one can shake us when we know that God is for us. Good angels are certainly not going to try to separate us from God's love, and evil angels or rulers or principalities cannot separate us. In fact, no power in heaven or on earth can do that. Time is powerless against us, whether the, the present with its problems, nor the future with all its uncertainties. Height and depth, they were astrological terms. The ancients were terrified by the tyranny of the stars, as, as are some people today. They cannot affect our lives, nor any other created thing. Have we missed anything? I think Paul covered all the issues. In the end, nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can touch our lives that does not first pass through his protecting shield of love that surrounds us. And I think, what, ass what assurance, what, what a promise, what victory. And it's yours, Christian. All of that is yours. You stay firmly in Christ. I'm reminded of a scene in Acts chapter 27. I'm almost done, by the way. Except you guys are used to it. You just went to a two-hour funeral yesterday. So we can be here a while. But in Acts chapter 27, Luke, Luke describes a time when when Paul was on a ship caught in a storm. And after much distress, God informed Paul that he and the crew would survive. But there was a qualifier in that survival, and you can look that up in Acts chapter 27. There's a qualifier on their survival because verse 31 tells us, Paul, Paul told those on board, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. But where was the safe place for the sailors that day? It's on the ship. If someone took it upon themselves to abandon the ship that the really good swimmers thought they could just swim to shore, they would perish. And in the same way, unless we remain in Christ, we cannot be saved. The security is in Christ. If we depart, which we are always free to do, we have none of the guarantees that God gives us in this passage. I'm going to close with a story. My wife reminded me I've used this story. Yeah, I have. I've used this story a lot, probably several times, really. I like this story. Kind of like if I get a good joke. <laughs> the key is a good joke. <laughs> You might hear it two or three, four or five times. When I find a story I really like, I, I look for sermons to use it in. I close with, a young soldier found himself in a terrible battle during the Scottish Reformation. The enemy was soundly defeating this young man's army. He and his comrades found themselves hastily reti retreating from the battlefield in defeat, running away in fear of their very lives. The enemy gave chase. This young man ran hard and fast, full of fear and desperation, and soon found himself cut off from his comrades in arms. He eventually came upon a rocky ledge containing a cave. Knowing the enemy was close behind and that he was exhausted from the chase, he chose to hide there in that cave. And after he crawled in, he, he fell to his face in the darkness, desperately crying to God to save him. 
and protect him from the enemies. He made a bargain with God. He promised that if God saved him, he would serve him for the remainder of his days. When he looked up from his despairing plea for help, he saw a spider beginning to weave its web at the entrance to the cave. As he watched the delicate threads being slowly drawn across the mouth of the cave, the young soldier pondered its irony. He thought, I asked God for protection and deliverance, and he sent me a spider instead. How can a spider save me? His heart was hardened, knowing the enemy would soon discover his hiding place and kill him. And soon he did hear the sound of his enemies who were now scouring the area looking for those in hiding. One soldier with a gun slowly walked up to the cave's entrance. As the young man crouched in the darkness, hoping to surprise the enemy in a last-minute desperate attempt to save his own life, he felt his heart pounding wildly out of control. As the enemy cautiously moved forward to enter the cave, he came upon the spider's web which by now was completely strung across the opening. And he backed away. And he called out to a comrade, they can't be any, there can't be anyone in here. They would have had to break the spider's web to enter the cave. Let's move on. And years later, this young man who had made good on his promise by becoming a preacher, he wrote about that ordeal. And he wrote, where God is, a spider's web is as a stone wall. Where God is not, a stone wall is as a spider's web. What shall we say of these things? God is for us. Who is against us? Father, that's a great reminder. Thank you for your word, Father. Thank you for preserving everything that we need to know about life and godliness. And as we embark upon life that is sometimes tough, days are sometimes really difficult just to get to the end of the day. When we feel like our head is in a vice or we feel like there's inner turmoil, and we, we don't know what to do, we feel like the enemy is winning, When we feel like the pandemic is, is crushing us, when we don't know which way to turn, help us to hold fast to your word and this reminder that you are for us. And with you for us, you can even use a spider. So God, I thank you for the family of God. Thank you for the strength that we have by being part of the family of God. And, and um, we, one another, each other, in the days to come, I pray that we would just find great strength from being together. But ultimately, we would find great strength just knowing that you are God, and if you're for us, it doesn't really matter who's against us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Forsaken. I 
How many of you like going to the dentist? Huh? Or the doctor? No, I'm one that, well, I'll wait until I'm completely in terrible pain before I go to the dentist or the doctor. And I have two stories. Most of you know that um, I have had a, lots of different operations. Uh, Brother uh, Charles uh, was, when he was here, he was with the, the last operation that he was here, uh, here, he was in the room, and I kept, my wife told me that I kept saying, Dr. Charles, Dr. Charles, is that right? So, you know I was a little nuts, huh? And I still am. Well, I want to tell you about this one operation that I had, well, two of them, but first one, the, uh, several years ago, I had both corneas replaced, and not at the same time, one and then the, the other one later on. It was by Dr. Russell in, in Scott's Bluff. And uh, they put this, I was laying down, they put this deal around my head so it doesn't move. And uh, I was awake while they was doing the, the operation. And they take this little tiny uh, circle deal like a cupcake cutter, and they, they cut your cornea out. And when they cut your cornea out, then there's a, Time right in between there that's really dangerous because the cornea, uh, because uh, in the eye, if, you, if they don't get that uh, straight and just, uh, get that other cornea on top, you can lose your sight. And uh, Dr. Cor uh, Dr. Russell was doing that, and all of a sudden he put his finger on my eye and uh, was holding the cornea down, and he was yelling at the other people there to uh, get some medicine because the pressure was too high, and he couldn't get the other cornea that uh, was uh, a donor's, uh, couldn't get the cornea back on my because of the pressure. I'm going to leave that story for just a minute, and I'm going to go to another story. And uh, just a while back, I uh, went to a doctor in in Shellsburg in, in Cheyenne. I had this growth on my forehead on the side, and uh, it was hurting. And uh, so I took 
some of Marilyn's uh, goop that she puts on her face, you know, and I put that on, and it's, it's, and, uh, it softened it up, you know, made it feel better. So uh, the next day, it was hurting again. So I put some more on and softened it up, you know. I did that for about a month. And finally, I had a call the skin care doctor in, in, in uh, Cheyenne and run over there and get that looked at. And so they cut a little piece off. And uh, later on, they, I went back home and they called me and said, uh, you have cancer. And so we're going to have to cut that off. So I made an appointment and went back and, and uh, she uh, gave me some medicine and I was awake and cut that all off and, and such. Now I'll go back to the first story with Dr. Russell. I was in the, I went every three months to have my eyes looked at. And uh, doctor, the last time I went then, uh, Dr. Russell uh, told me, we can't do anything more for your eyes. You, uh, I had keratoconus. There's nothing else we can do except uh, a cornea to transplant. So I said, well, what, what's, what do we do? And he said, uh, we're going to put you on the list, and when we get a cornea, uh, a donor's cornea, we'll call you, and, and you come in, and we'll transplant it. Uh, okay, and how long do you think that will be? And he said, well, anywhere from six months to a year. Okay. Well, I was at work the next day. That was Thursday. The next day was Friday. My wife gets a call from Dr. Russell's nurse. We got a we got a cornea for you. She said, it's unheard of getting a cornea this, this soon. Can you go in Saturday and, and have this operation? Well, of course. No, I want to be there. <laughs> so that's when I had the operation. And then the next day, then I had to go back after the operation. Uh, I had to go back to Dr. Corn, uh, Dr. Russell's office. And um, uh, he was telling me uh, about the, about the, first of all, he took the bandage off and he said, can you see my finger? And that I said, yeah, it was really blurry and such, but I could see his fingers, one, two, and three. And then he told me the story about uh, his putting the, his uh, finger on my uh, cornea. He said when he was a, just a, in, uh, a student, he was in an operation room helping this doctor uh, doing a cornea transplant. And the, when they cut it off, there was so much pressure on, the, on this uh, gentleman or, or lady, I don't know who, on the cornea transplant, that the cornea popped off. And the doctor told him, sew him up, there's nothing we can do. He's going to be blind. So Dr. Russell said he was sewing him up, and he was thinking, this isn't right. There's got to be something that if I ever see this again, then I can do. And so he thought, I'll put my finger on their eye. So 20 years later, because of that instance, he put his finger on my eye, and I have sight. Now, who was in charge there? God allowed him to have that thought. 20 years later, for me, he was taking care of me. In the same way he takes care of you. God, 20 or 30 years ago, might have done something to help you today. 2,000 years ago, his son died on the cross for you and me. Dr. Shelsberg, skin cancer doctor, he told me, Ken, why did you wait so long to come in? But I didn't want to hear the word cancer, <laughs> you know. He said, if you would have come in, all we had to do was cut that off. But you waited. And now I have to dig it out. And this cancer has little technical tentacles, and I got to get all that. And if you would have come, it would just been a, just a simple, simple thing. Same way with sin. Sin gets in our lives, and we don't do nothing about it. But what does it do? It's deeper and deeper 
and deeper. Dr. Schellsberg said, also she goes, every week, examine yourself. When you find something, if you do, get in here. Well, the greatest physician in the world, our spiritual physician, also said, examine yourself. I'd like to read from 2 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Father, you are so awesome. You're the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings. You know things that's going to happen before they happen. <laughs> you sit on your judgment seat in your greatest throne forever. You're still there. You're taking care of us. We'll look upon you. Times of trouble, it's you. Times of heartache, it's you. In times of gladness, joy, it's you. You're there for us, guiding us and protecting us. Dear Holy Father, as we come now to partake of your supper, Dear Holy Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me, Dear Holy Father. If I see someone that I need to talk to, help me to say to them about you. Thank you, dear new Father, for your son who died on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen.